Okay, okay, okay. Welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and today I will be hosting a debate uh, between, excuse me, William Albrecht and Francis Turretin. Uh, they're going to be debating the Assumption of Mary, and I'm really excited about this. Do us a favor, click subscribe, click the bell button, and also if you think this debate is good, which I promise you you will in at least five minutes, do us a favor and share this debate so people can be thinking about high-minded, beautiful theological things and not just what's going on in the country right now. We're going to have opening statements, 15 minutes each. William's going to start. Then there'll be a cross-examination, 20 minutes each. Uh, after Francis has his 15 minutes, of course. Then we're going to have 13 minutes of audience questions, uh, and then finally closing statements. So, really looking forward to this. G'day, guys. It's lovely to have you here. Thrilled to be Thanks here for with you. Yeah, do us a favor. Give us a real quick intro to, to both of you. Francis, you want to begin? Sure. I'm a Presbyterian and Reformed blogger. I've been dis debating theology for a number of years. And uh, actually, William and I have done many debates uh, together and in including, I think, one on this subject, maybe uh, about a decade ago, maybe even more. Uh, so, of course, the, the dogma hasn't officially hasn't changed since then, but hopefully we've each grown uh, a little bit in that time. So I Thanks. look forward to this debate today. Well, thanks for being willing to come on. Yeah, William. Thank you very much. Uh, thrilled to be here with you again, Matt, uh, your fantastic platform. Uh, I'm a Catholic apologist and an author. I've been debating for a very long time. Uh, I've been debating my friend, a uh, Tirton fan, for a long time as well. I think we debated this about 13 years ago. It's been quite some time, but um, you're right. Um, new theology, perhaps documents, manuscripts do get, get discovered. But uh, in my opinion, the uh, antiquity of the dogma remains as strong as ever. And uh, God willing, hopefully today uh, we will be able to... Uh, share that and share our thoughts and uh, do so in fellowship and brotherly fellowship as good friends. And uh, I look forward to our dialogue. All right. Terrific. Well, as I say, each of you uh, is going to have 15 minutes to lay out your position. And this is really important. So if you're a Catholic watching today, please listen to what Francis has to say. And if you're a Protestant, please listen to what William has to say. We want to do this in a spirit of Christian charity, as William said. So William, you'll go first. So whenever you begin, I will click the 15 minute timer. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Matt. Great. Uh, thrilled to be here with a uh, Turretin fan and, and with Matt to talk about the bodily assumption of Holy Mary. Ludwig Ott, Father Ludwig Ott, tells us that this is a dogma, de fide, and it's defined that Holy Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. After Pope Pius XII, on May 1st, 1946, addressed all the bishops of the world and in an official query whether the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven could be defined as a proposition of faith and whether they with their clergy and people desired the definition when almost all bishops replied in the affirmative on the 1st of November, he promulgated the apostolic constitution munificentissimus Deus, a dogma revealed by God that Mary, the immaculate perpetually virgin mother of God, after the completion of her earthly life was assumed body and soul into the glory of heaven. The Catechism is very clear as it lays it forth as well, echoing the words of Munificentissimus Deus. At the heart of this teaching of Holy Mary is that uh, St. Mary is indeed the Ark of the New Covenant. The Catechism of the Catholic Church echoes the words of the earliest centuries, noting that Mary, in whom the Lord himself has just made his dwelling, is the daughter of Zion in person, the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the glory of the Lord dwells. She is the dwelling of God with men. Such is noted uh, even by a liberal scholar, Father Raymond Brown, where he notes that uh, St. Luke portrays Mary as the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabernacle of Divine Glory, he notes. That he notes the language uh, echoing uh, Luke 1, and all of this is leading, of course, to the bodily assumption of Mary to where we will fully understand why we talk about this being biblical and ancient. The Catechism tells us, in the Theophanies of the Old Testament, the cloud, now obscure, now luminous, reveals the living and saving God. While veiling the transcendence of his glory with Moses on Mount Sinai, at the tent of meeting, and during the wandering in the desert, with Solomon at the dedication of the temple. In the Holy Ghost, Christ fulfills these figures. The Spirit comes upon Mary, overshadows her, so that she might conceive and give birth to Christ. On the mountain of transfiguration, the Holy Ghost in the cloud came and overshadowed Christ, Moses and Elijah, Peter, James, and John. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son 
my chosen, listen to him. The glory of the Lord overshadows multiple times the ark filling the tabernacle. We note this parallelism clearly in Luke 1, 39 to 45. We read of, in those days, Mary arose and went into haste into the hill country to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how is this granted me that the mother of my kudias, the mother of my Lord, should come to me? Such parallelisms are not lost on the biblical-minded person. Indeed, as you can find in our book, uh, The Definitive Guide on on Mariology, you find uh, a passage where we note Luke the Evangelist skillfully rearranged his material in the Gospels' initial chapters to make the strongest possible of parallels between the mother of the Lord and the ark of the Lord. In comparing the Old Testament to Luke, he clearly depends directly on the Greek Old Testament. This, as noted by one of the top Mariologists in the world, and indeed probably the top Dormition scholar, the Reverend Dr. Daly, noting that this is a matter of divine revelation. So, so many parallels. We don't have time to get to them all. We do want to get to the heart of what we are talking about today. If we establish that Holy Mary is indeed the Ark of the New Covenant, which we indeed, uh, so many parallels can and should establish establish such, such as the Ark in 2 Samuel 6, traveling to the house of Obedim in the hill country of Judea. Well, Mary travels to the house of Elizabeth and Zechariah in the hill country of Judea in Luke 1, 39 including David's shouting in the presence of the ark in 2 Samuel 6, and the unique shouting or exclaiming of St. Elizabeth in the presence of St. Mary in Luke 1. There are many more examples, many more parallels, but indeed it should suffice to show that this is not mere typology or symbolism, but as the Reverend Dr. Daly notes and Dr. Shoemaker, a matter of divine revelation. In Revelation 11, we read, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Note how in the beginning, Scripture was free-flowing. We didn't have this uh, uh, chapter breakup that we would get later from the great archbishop Langton and and, um, divisions of chapters and numberings. So Revelation 11 clearly is tied uh, to 12, as it's at the very end of 11, verse 19, it, it, we see uh, the heavens open. We see the temple of God open in heaven, the Ark of the Covenant in his temple, lightning, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. And then another sign, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with a moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. So we read of multiple signs in heaven. We read of this woman clothed with the sun with a crown of twelve stars who undoubtedly is Holy Mary. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born well she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron the strong incredible language cannot be denied that the child born to saint mary indeed is our lord and savior and who is the child born in revelation 12 it is hearkening to that messianic psalm from the book of psalms of course so we have more parallelisms of saint mary and indeed we recognize in the early church, the multitude of interpretations of this being Holy Mary, as well as it being uh, the church, and even the twofold interpretation of it. Today, we believe this is a very clear, strong indication of Mary being bodily present in heaven. The Pope saw this. The early fathers saw this. Scripture is clearly laying this out. So this is very clear and important language we must recognize. But indeed, for the other element, as I've gone about seven minutes looking at scripture, looking at, of course, some brief allusions to lay out 
what would require much more time to lay out a rock solid case, but to give you a brief taste of the fact that scripture undoubtedly refers to Holy Mary as a new ark of the new covenant. That new ark remains important all throughout reaching the pinnacle in Revelation 12, where the woman is in the heavens, crowned in the heavens. And that woman is the mother of the Messiah. But what about early, early church as today's discussion is about the Bible and about the early fathers? Is this biblical? Is this ancient? Ephraim the Syrian says, and of course, note how a lot of the times, here's a magnificent thing when you, you encounter a number of these early fathers, is that you, you, you don't hear them saying, okay, well, we, uh, we have a written uh, eyewitness account of what happened. You have a lot of these fathers saying, we simply don't know the exact details of the bodily assumption of Holy Mary, but we know this has been passed down from the apostles. This is passed down from divine uh, revelation, as Pope Pius noted as well. So a lot of the times they, they provide you with poetic kind of scenarios. And even, even Jacob, St. Jacob says, uh, this is what I imagined happened on that day when St. Mary was taken body and soul into heaven. The great St. Ephraim, doctor, deacon, and doctor of the Catholic Church says, for Mary, I'm about to enter his living paradise in the place in which Eve succumbed. I shall glorify him. For all created women, he was most pleased with me, and he willed that I should be mother to him. And it pleased him that he should be a child to me. To a great height, he lifted me with my saints that I might glorify him in the broad and vast heaven full of his glory. This is a uh, new and unique translation provided to, for us by the uh, incredible eminent scholar, Dr. Brock, who indicates Ephraim the Syrian's clear teaching on this note. Timothy of Jerusalem, uh, and you will note how today I will not take the definitive position uh, of whether or not the Pope says Mary dies or remains immortal in the Munificentissimus Deus, because even though I do believe it is rather clear in the dogmatic statement in and of itself, uh, it is open to whether one would like to believe she remained immortal or she died. I think it's a more nuanced kind of position that I would be willing to discuss later. But in my opening, I am reading scripture and the early fathers. Timothy of Jerusalem, the virgin is immortal to this day. Now, he doesn't indicate whether or not he believes she dies, but he believes she is alive eternally in heaven. He says, seeing that he who had dwelt in her transported her to the regions of her assumption. And you will note this very similar kind of language all throughout the early church fathers, particularly once we get to a, a subset of perhaps patristic literature, if you will, where we call these fathers Dormition and Assumption figures, where these magnificent fathers begin to speculate on this incredible event that occurred in history, the event of Holy Mary's being taken up body and soul into heaven. This is present in, in, in sacramentaries, in liturgies. We even hear about it mentioned in council and in the early church fathers. This is particularly a teaching unanimous amongst the apostolic churches. You may be saying, what are you talking about? These apostolic churches, Orthodox and Catholic, they can agree on something. Yeah, they do agree on this. So that's, that's something in and of itself. Uh, John the theologian says, and from that time forth, all knew the spotless and precious body had been transferred to paradise. It's Dormition and Mary. Gregory of Tours notes how Holy Mary rejoices with the Lord's chosen ones. Theotechnos of Livias says, it was fitting. Very, very interesting how this language is echoed by the magnificent blessed Duns Scotus, the greatest Mariologist to ever live. It was fitting that the most holy body of Mary, God-bearing body, receptacle of God, divinized, incorruptible, illuminated by divine grace and full glory, should be entrusted to the earth for a little while and then raised up to heaven in glory with her soul pleasing to God. That's his homily on the Assumption. Some date to the late 500s, likelier to be the early 600s as this, these manuscripts uh, discovered and translated by Antoine Wenger, uh, eventually translated into English only by two living people. And the only two living people is the Reverend Dr. Daly and the Reverend Dr. Coppice, who have provided a full translation on Theotechnos and what he has to say there about the Dormition and bodily Assumption of Mary. Modestus of Jerusalem, as the most glorious mother of Christ, our Savior, 
and God and the giver of life and immortality has been endowed with, endowed with life by him, she has received an inc eternal incorruptibility of the body together with him who has raised her up from the tomb and has taken her up to himself in a way only known to him. If you are wondering if we will deal with pseudo Melito, if you're wondering if we'll deal with the transitist literature, we will, but this is my opening. I don't uh, go on the uh, defensive and I don't attack my opponent before even hearing his opening statement. So uh, I have no idea what the chat is saying or what the audience are, 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 are thinking. I, God willing, they're being edified. But I promise you, we'll cover all of the all that ground in a very healthy discussion today with my dear friend, uh, Turretin Femme. But there's more because we get to the time of, of the great Germanus, St. Germanus of Constantinople and the great St. John Damascene. I want to remind you all that we've we visited the 300s. But indeed, uh, what does uh, Dr. Shoemaker and the Reverend Dr. Daly and the Reverend Dr. Coppins, what do they tell us about the literature and the documents that have been handed down through the ages? Well, Lafroy tells you that the documents that are that have been circulating, that circulated, are apostolic, he argues. Well, Dr. Shoemaker tells you that all the stories of Mary's bodily assumption probably have as, as, as its origin of being written in the 100s with an apostolic, with an apostolic deposit. The same being told to us by the Reverend Dr. Daly. You find it over and over in the top scholars of the bodily assumption, the fact that this teaching was passed down from divine revelation through divine tradition with clear, clear seeds and allusions and teaching in holy writ, which is why Germanus tells us what he, what he does and why St. John Damascene also talks about Mary being bodily assumed in heaven. This again, has all the marks of apostolicity. This is particularly why, I wish the popes had defined it before, but particularly why there was no pushback when this was defined. Every apostolic church agrees on this. Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, and Catholic. Those give you clear marks of apostolicity. And I know we're not talking about the perpetual virginity of St. Mary today, but much like that and other Marian dogmas, it has the unanimous consent of the apostolic churches. And my time is up. I can't wait to hear my friend Francis open. All right. Thank you very much for that. Francis, whenever you want to begin, I'll click the timer. Thanks so much. I appreciate the cordial opening, and I look forward to discussing this important topic. The topic is, we could characterize it this way, what happened to Mary? The last clear reference to Mary, the mother of Jesus in scripture is in Acts 1, 14, where she shows up with Jesus' brethren. Scripture doesn't tell us what became of Mary, in particular beyond that. And the dogma of the Immaculate Conception doesn't help us much. It just says this, the Immaculate Mother of God, the ever Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. When I say it doesn't help us much, that dogma, as it's written, just says the course of her earthly life, it doesn't specify whether she died or lived. It doesn't specify whether she was translated into heaven like Enoch or Elijah, or whether she was raised from the dead, as in the transitus literature. It is uh, an important doctrine from the standpoint of Roman Catholic and Protestant dialogues, though, because Pope Pius XII, I may just refer to him as Pope Pius to not keep on repeating the longer name every time, stated in this same definition, it is forbidden to any man to change this, our declaration, pronouncement, and definition, or by rash attempt to oppose and counter it. If any man should presume to take, to, excuse me, to make such an attempt, let him know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of the blessed apostles, Peter and Paul. Now, I, I don't believe that Pope Pius speaks for God or for the apostles, Peter and Paul. And I don't think that Peter or Paul or God have any wrath against people who disagree with what Pope Pius said on that on this dogma. However, uh, there is, as I said, not much detail there. All it just says is that she was assumed body and soul. It doesn't explain whether she died first, she was raised to life. In fact, it's actually not 
clear from that just the words assumption whether she was resurrected or whether her body and soul were separately but at the same time brought to heaven and however the catechism of the catholic church 966 i believe says that the assumption of the blessed virgin is a singular participation in her son's resurrection and in anticipation of the resurrection of other christians so the catholic catechism's position which is you know somewhat official at least is uh, that she was resurrected however it says singular participation in that resurrection so i guess it's open to to some uh, interpretation in any event scripture teaches us this first corinthians 15 20 to 23 but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept for since by man came death by man came also the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order christ the first fruits afterward they that are christ's at his coming if mary were also in anticipation of the resurrection of christians this would have been the perfect place for paul to mention that he did not there you can speculate about why its silence is there but the bottom line is this is not what paul taught that mary is in anticipation of the resurrection of other christians it's a later teaching it's not the apostle paul's teaching in 1950 this doctrine was defined in a document entitled it's a little bit of a tongue twister for me munificentissimus deus means the most munificent god and there's a 48 paragraph document it cites various scriptures church councils church fathers and so on and i'm going to focus primarily on the scriptural aspects of this because uh well i'll explain why in a second when we get to that the premise of the dogma though is ex expressed clearly in paragraph five now this is a quotation now god has willed that the blessed virgin mary should be exempted from his general rule she by an entirely unique privilege completely overcame sin by her immaculate conception and as a result she was not subject to the law of remaining in the corruption of the grave and she did not have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body so the document itself recognizes that this would be a unique exception to what scriptural has laid out as the general rule. This general rule is we're all waiting. Any believer who dies is waiting until Christ's coming for resurrection. But there's a claim that there's an exception here. I think it should go without saying that the exception should be established, not just asserted. Paragraph 41 makes the interesting claim that the dogma is this truth, which is based on the sacred writings and sacred writings there doesn't mean just any writings that are in the library, it means the scriptures and paragraph 38 makes the even bolder claim that all these proofs and considerations of the Holy Fathers and the theologians are based upon the sacred writings as their ultimate foundation. So keep in mind that according to the very document that defines the bodily assumption, the ultimate foundation is the sacred writings, meaning the scriptures. But what argument is there from scripture? Well, the paragraph 14 gives us an argument that says, Christ's faithful through the teaching and leadership of their pastors have learned from the sacred books that the Virgin Mary throughout the course of her earthly pilgrimage led a life troubled by cares, hardships, and sorrows, and that moreover, what the holy old man Simeon had foretold actually came to pass. That is, that a terribly sharp sword pierced her heart as she stood under the cross of her divine son, our Redeemer. We can agree with this. This is unobjectionable. On the other hand, we start to see questionable uses of scripture, starting in paragraph 26. And I'm going to highlight five main uses of scripture that are identified in the document. The first is Psalm 132. In, I'm using the, uh, in the Psalms, I'm using the Protestant numbering, the Vulgate numbering is off by one. So Psalm 132, eight, arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. And here the argument hinges on interpreting arise into thy strength as ascend into heaven and further interpreting the ark of thy strength as Mary. Now, William has already presented some, some discussion about that subject and perhaps we'll come back to that at an appropriate time. But suffice to say that I, I the, the idea that she is the ark of the covenant and that she's mentioned here in Psalm 132 can't really be established, can't be persuasively established. Let's put it like that. Psalm 45, Psalm 45, 10 through 14 describes a daughter who's brought to the king. And this passage is 
treated as describing Mary, the idea of describing Mary as the bride of Jesus, who Jesus will desire for her beauty, that's there in the song, is a little bit uh, troubling if you try to apply this kind of quasi-literal interpretation. The bride of Christ, though, is correctly the church. And that's not to be understood in a literal way, of course. It's supposed to be understood as a metaphor. Song of Solomon. There's a couple of passages from Song of Solomon. The first is Psalm, Song of Solomon 30, uh, 3, 6. This one says, Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? And this argument hinges on the coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, being interpreted as ascending up like pillars of smoke. And it seems to be uh, not correctly identifying the, the person in question as being Solomon. The very next verse talks about Solomon's bed. Uh, the woman of Revelation 12 is the next uh, major topic. And Pius mentions the woman of Revelation 12 clothed with the sun, but doesn't really explain the relevance. There are only two things that seem to have any link. One, she's clothed with, clothed with the sun, and the wonder of this is described as being in heaven. Of course, in verse 1, <clears throat> she's that clothed in that way, and she's also giving birth. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a bit of a dry throat. Uh, so this has nothing to do, the fact that she's, the wonder is in heaven, and she's clothed with the sun, doesn't have anything to do with Mary being in heaven, because in that same verse, she's giving birth to a son. This woman is giving birth to a son. If that's Mary giving birth to Jesus, no one claims that Mary gave birth to Jesus while in heaven. And keep in mind, the red dragon mentioned in the next verse is also another wonder in heaven. The other possible uh, way to try to uh, associate this with an assumption is to say she's given win wings as an eagle at verse 14. Because that would allow you to fly, and that would somehow, you know, be associated with coming off of the ground. But in the in the chapter, there is actually mention of someone being caught up to God. The problem for this dogma is that the person who's caught up to God is the man child, which does point to Christ. And in fact, a better interpretation of this woman is not Mary, but the Old Testament Church, and. One reason for looking at it like that is not just the fact that it doesn't align with uh, uh, bodily assumption or the fact that it's obviously a vision, since uh, we're not claiming that Mary, I hope, was literally clothed with the literal sun, or that she had a crown of, uh, etc. with these in, in a literal sense. Rather, it's uh, it's a picture, it's a vision of something else. And the woman in Revelation 12 not only has the man child, but also additional children. So if it is Mary, it's not the perpetual virgin of Pope Pius. Song, the final biblical passage that's quoted is Song of Solomon 8.5. Song of Solomon 8.5 says, Who is this that comes up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree, there thy mother brought thee forth, there she brought thee forth that bare thee. And Pius quotes St. Bonaventure, who applies this text in an accommodated sense to Mary and concludes that she must be bodily with Jesus. Leaving aside the fact that the text has nothing to do with Mary, it's very odd to make Solomon Jesus and to make Mary Solomon's lover in the Song of Solomon. In addition to that, there's no reason to interpret this phrase up from the wilderness to imply anything about ascension into heaven. So ultimately, each of these biblical attempts to establish the doctrine fail, which should be troubling when the statement made in the document is that the ultimate foundation of this document is scripture. And I say that it's, it should be troubling because the document doesn't say we have this view on the basis of extra scriptural tradition. On the other hand, this view does seem to come from extra scriptural tradition. The oldest reference that we have to this, it is an ancient view. It's just not an ancient view in its earliest time from the writings of the Orthodox Fathers. Instead, this comes from fairly unreliably 
trans or unreliably communicated to us transitist literature, which describes Mary being dying, being buried for three days, rising again from the dead and being, ascending into heaven, which bears a clear parallel to Jesus, but lacks any scriptural support. There's no account in scripture of this happening. Scripture doesn't testify that it will happen, that it did happen, or that it would happen. And uh, instead, the first reference that we have that's typically brought to mind when we when they discuss these topics is the writings of Epiphanius. Epiphanius mentions his own view of Mary, but when it comes to her death or not, he writes, uh, and of course he's responding to some heretics. I think it's important to recognize that. But he writes, if some think us mistaken, let them search the scriptures, which again, is what I encourage everyone to do on this subject, is let them search the scriptures. They will not find Mary's death. They will not find whether she died or did not die. They will not find whether she was buried or was not buried. Scripture is absolutely silent on this particular topic. And then when he starts to talk about the subject, he says that he, that he doesn't know whether she died or didn't die. And he says either the Holy Virgin died and was buried, or she was killed, or she remained alive, since nothing is impossible with God and he could do whatever her, he desires for her end, no one knows. So there's not some reliable extra scriptural tradition that was around at the time of Epiphanius that he was aware of that allowed him to identify the end of Mary in a, in a way that would allow him to say, here's the actual, uh, actual history of what happened. Now, that might not stop Epiphanius from thinking that, that Mary is now with God and that she's even their body and soul with God. But remember that the claim of the bodily assumption is not just that Mary is bodily and spiritually with God, but that she was, that, but that this is a matter of divine revelation. Is it possible for God to do this? It, God brought Enoch to him without Enoch seeing death, and he brought Elijah to him without Elijah seeing death. Could he have done so with Mary? Perhaps, but he hasn't re revealed that. Instead, he's revealed a general principle to which Mary would be an exception, and the demonstration of that exception hasn't been accomplished. And if, if there's any, I think there's a few remaining seconds, but I'll yield them back. All right. Thank you very much. We are going to now move into a time of cross-examination where each debater will have 20 minutes each to cross-examine his opponent. And just so everybody knows the way cross-examination works. Whoa there, is that me or you? Oh, Crikey, that is that's not me. me. That, that is blowing my ear up. Um, the way cross-examination works is the one who's doing the cross-examination is free to uh, interrupt, to change the subject, to move the conversation along. This is this is just how it works. It's not him being a big meanie, so everyone just get over it. Um, William's going to start. Uh, you've got 20 minutes, and uh, then we'll... Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to... This is the problem using the online clock. Why would I do it? All right, here we go. So whenever whenever you want to start, uh, I'll click the 20 minute timer. Okay, I will begin now. Careful. All right. Turton fan, um, there are literally less than a handful of actual Dormition assumption scholars in the planet. The two most prominent ones that come to my mind are the Reverend Dr. Daly and, the, and uh, I don't think he's a Reverend, but Dr. Shoemaker. I don't even know what his faith persuasion is, to be honest, but uh, these are the only two that have translated the vast majority, if not the complete corpus of these writings to English. And when I say these writings, I mean fathers and writings in general to talk about the Dormition and the Assumption. And each of them say that the origin of these writings are orthodox and apostolic. Do you disagree with them? Or uh, do you agree with them? Or do you disagree with them? And if you do disagree with them, I'm curious, uh, uh, on the basis of what would you disagree with this their meticulous research in this particular topic. So there are there are good reasons to reject the idea that the tradition that Mary was 
bodily assumed is an apostolic tradition. One example of a reason to reject that idea is Epiphanius' apparent uh, lack of knowledge of this tradition and the conflicting traditions on whether Mary died or didn't die. When, when, um, when you talk about uh, Epiphanius or, or Epiphanius, however people, people want to be stickly to pronounce that doesn't really matter to me, um, but I, I go between both so just so people can understand the same person. When you talk about Epiphanius, you're talking about the Panarian 78, is that correct? Correct. What about Panarian 79, which he wrote uh, a few years later, where he re revisits the end of Mary's life and actually says that Mary was taken up to heaven. And this particular text that he wrote a few years after Panarian 78, after his research, Reverend Daly, the Reverend Dr. Daly and Dr. Shoemaker note that when he revisits the topic, he reaches a conclusion that he believes Mary was bodily assumed into heaven. All right. Is well, there a question there? Or? Yeah, my, my, yeah. My question to you is: you you list uh, Epiphanius as evidence with Panarian seventy eight, yet in Panarian seventy nine, written later, he reaches his ultimate conclusion on Mary's end, and it is that she was taken up to heaven. So how how can uh, Panarian seventy eight, written beforehand, be your evidence against this having early origin if? your very source that you used in your opening and right now as an answer concludes that Mary was bodily assumed. Well, I suppose that we would have to investigate what, what aspect of uh, 79 is in mind. One, one of the passages that's usually cited is from section 5.1. And that section said, do you want me to read it or? I, I, you can go ahead and read it. Yeah, yeah. If you want to read it, and I, I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Okay, so it says, uh, for what for what this set that he's refer the cult the sect he's referring to are Coloridians who worshipped yep. Mary by giving her cakes and so forth. For what this sect has to say is complete nonsense and, as it were, an old wives' tale. Which scripture has spoken of it? What which prophet permitted the worship of a man, let alone a woman? The vessel is choice, but a woman, and by nature, no different. Like the bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up and has not seen death. She is like John, who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like Saint Thecla. And Mary is still more honored than she because of the providence vouchsafed her. But Elijah is not to be worshipped, even though he is alive. And John is not to be worshipped, even though by his own prayer, or rather by grace, by receiving the grace from God, he made an awesome thing of his falling asleep. But neither is Thecla worshipped, nor any of the saints. So, if that's the passage on which this, uh, yeah, on which that, this, that, that, you know, is premised, then the, the, there's a couple of flaws with that. I mean, one of the flaws is you're reading a lot into the parallel with Elijah, since although Elijah was uh, translated. Uh, there is absolutely no reason to think that Thecla what, received the same. Thecla is a martyr, an early Christian martyr. Right, yeah, that, that, that is not the parallelism, though, that, that uh, Epiphanius is making. The parallelism Epiphanius is making is our various ones. Number one, Elijah being bodily translated, but the parallel, parallels are not the same for all of them. Thecla was a, a virgin, so he's drawing the parallel of her being a virgin. And, and John's, uh, he's, he's hearkening to an, uh, an apocryphal tale that talks about him being uh, his dormition. So uh, I understand, I'm not saying Tekla was bodily assumed or all of these are bodily assumed at all. They're parallels that are being drawn. And if Epiphanius, years after his original agnosticism, revisits this and the parallel he draws with Elijah was her being virgin from the mother's womb, always remained so, and taken up, to heaven, it uses the actual Greek word in the Byzantine liturgy of the Assumption. How is this not clear that he is reaching the conclusion that Mary was taken, translated to heaven? Uh, well, for the most obvious answer to that is that he doesn't say that Mary was translated to heaven. Okay, so when it says that she is like Elijah, uh, who was virgin, 
Romaine stone was taken up. He is not drawing the parallel of her being taken up into heaven. No, I think you're assuming that aspect of it, but it, she's like well, Elijah and the exact details of how she's like him are, are an, definitely an interesting question. But since the triple parallel that's given is Elijah, John and Thecla or Tecla, same, same name, uh, sure, whatever uh, the, uh, that since that's the triple parallel, the thing that they have in common is their, you know, this exceptional holiness, and of course, in his view, virginity. So let let me ask you this: uh, since I I don't want to waste too much more time in this, we clearly don't agree upon this. Uh, 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 let me ask you: Are you aware that every single figure that I just listed, Lafrost, actually, let's, let's stick to English ones, Doctor Shoemaker, the Reverend Doctor Daly. They all agree that Epiphanius is talking about Mary being translated here. Do you disagree with their conclusion that knowing that they are the top Assumption and Dormition scholars, you would disagree with their conclusion on St. Epiphanius here? I, I think it's much more valuable to deal with what does the text say than trying to get a you know, nose count on well, the scholars. What well, do the scholars well, I'm, say? I'm just, I, just want, I just want to know if you, you disagree with them. That's correct on Epiphanius. I think it's clear that I've come to a different conclusion than okay. the one that, that they, in, in conjunction with the churches that it, I understand that they're part of, uh, you okay. know, hold. So I, I don't know what, what church uh, Shoemaker is a part of. I don't even know if he's a believer. Let me be clear about that. But uh, let, let's move on then. Um, I just wanted that to be, uh, to be clear for the audience. Church, in fact, if we look at the very first reformers, indeed, if we trace the lineage of all the first reformers, the Morningstar reformers as well, um, obviously before we get to the later era, you find that they held the belief in the bodily assumption of Mary. What, if, if these first reformers, including great luminaries such as Jan Hus, held, and Wycliffe, held to the principle of sola scriptura, and yet they continued believing in the bodily assumption of Mary, on the basis of what? Were they relying on, on this heretical transitist literature? Or why did they continue believing in this teaching of Mary? Well, I suppose what we should probably start with is, is the point that I raised in my opening speech, which is that many people who hold to this view, including Pope Pius, who created this document that we're, that's become the, the basis of the debate, uh, they believe that they've that the ultimate foundation of their doctrine is scripture. Uh, the question, of course, is whether scripture actually supports that view, not whether or not, you know, some people come to that conclusion. But I think that a careful evaluation of scripture doesn't support that position at all. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's such an emphasis on extra scriptural tradition on this particular point. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to be, to, I was just curious if you had a, a thought as to why the very first reformers held to this, but I understand that scripturally you do not see it there, but you also don't see it there in the early church. And you brought up, let me be, be certain, because you brought it up before uh, in, in our dialogue in the past today, I think you alluded to it. Uh, you brought up pseudo Melito, right? The transitus and pseudo Melito. That, I that brought up the, the transitus literature, yeah. Okay. Do you, do you are referring to, uh, the text that has been condemned or you're referring what what exactly are you referring to when you you talk about the trends in this literature that is a good question because it's the it's a bit of a mess the transitus writings are a bit of a mess there's a variety of them the preservation of them is a little bit sketchy because they come in so many different forms it's hard to get an original form and it's one of those uh you know sticky issues of trying to to recreate an early document. And I suspect that part of the problem is that some, at least, of these early writings were, as you said, condemned. Let, let me ask you this. Let me be a little, I guess, narrow it down more. When we look at the um, pseudo Melita, which I'm not going to argue, I'm sure that uh, without a doubt was condemned, whether it was by Pope Galatius or not, it doesn't matter. Pope Cormistus did condemn it. So it doesn't matter if that Galatius text is legitimate or not. My question to you is this. When we look at any of the famous fathers which have been dubbed uh, Dormition and Assumption Fathers, do any of them rely on this text that has been condemned? 
And when you say, do they rely on it? Do you mean that they in other say, words, oh, we got this from that, that text? Either that or do any of them quote the text which has been condemned? It's really hard to know if they're quoting the text that's been condemned. Uh, as I said, there's uh, the you preservation of that text is really shaky. So you would recognize, though, that 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 uh, and I'm sorry for interrupting. You would recognize that John, um, uh, excuse me, St. John of Thessalonica and many of the other Dormition fathers, even if he disagreed, you would recognize that when they talk about the Dormition and Assumption, that they clearly note that they're not relying on the condemned literature, though. You would at least admit that I mean, it's right there in the text, right? Uh, I don't have that information in front of me to to verify okay. what you're what you're saying but I, if you say that indeed that they specifically say we didn't get it from that document uh then so be it i as i the general time period for that uh that writing is in the second century the late late second century is this transitive literature so by the time you know 100 years later 200 years later 300 years later the fact that someone didn't get it directly from it, the earliest sources of the doctrine isn't Particularly but the, her the heretical text itself, though, is much later, you would admit. There's not a single scholar that would put pseudo Melito second century. Ever. There's none that would ever date it that. It's much later. You would at least recognize that. So the the way that like Ludwig Ott, the way Ludwig Ott puts it, he will put he puts it in as these transitist narratives are of the fifth or sixth centuries, right? And that's from his fundamentals of Catholic dogma. Uh, but, you know, if you look at somebody like Juniper Carroll, he, he talks about it in terms of these apparently originating before the close of the fifth century. So, you know, these are both, Juniper Carroll is a respected Mariologist, uh, Ludwig Ott, you already quoted. You know, these yeah. are different, different reputed scholars and not mm -hmm. you know narrowly focused on the Dormition literature, obviously, but they are reputed scholars in this in the general sure. field, and there's some lack of uh, lack of agreement between them. So yeah, uh, there's there, no doubt there's also lack of agreement and Gigi who argued for uh, uh, something a little different. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. My my other question would be, uh, since we we clearly see the fathers are not relying on this heretical text for their belief in the assumption of Mary, what about the early Council of Nisibis? which does talk about Mary being bodily assumed in the 400s. Um, does this council rely on any heretical fabricated text? Again, when, when you say it did, does it rely on fabricated text? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, let me be clear. I mean, does it rely upon the heretical pseudo Melito text? Because as we've dialogued before in the past, you, you have said point blank in writing and in debate, that the origin of this was pseudo Melito. And, and James White, Dr. White, excuse me, has said this as well, that the origin of this is pseudo Melito. I'm, I'm just curious, if it's not pseudo Melito, then we can at least remove uh, the fact that this doesn't have any condemned heretical element to it in the early church. So that's why I'm asking you, if you look at the Council of Nisibis, does it quote any heretical text when it talks about Mary being bodily assumed? It's certainly not my position that it quotes a heretical text. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it doesn't get this doctrine from scripture. And I, I think if it did get it from scripture and it had a compelling argument for getting it from scripture, I think we'd be having that discussion rather than this one. Right. But uh, you would recognize that the Pope never says that this is explicitly defined in scripture. You, you would recognize that we're talking about the dogmatic decree and within the actual dogmatic definition, he doesn't give a promulgation in Psalm 132 or any of these other texts. You would recognize that, wouldn't you? I, he makes the claim that the ultimate foundation of this doctrine is sacred writings. Right, That's but does he, make, do, does he make a definitive definition on these texts in the document? You know, this is a really, you know, what counts as a definitive definition of the texts is a matter is part, of, you know, is, is your church's view. Right, it's a part of the. Infallible. I couldn't hear your question. I'm sorry. Is it part of the infallible definition of munificentissimus deus? So the usual way that it's parsed is the part where, which I quoted as being the dogma. That's usually the part that that's treated very narrowly as only this is infallible, and the rest it may or may not be infallible. You you talked about Revelation 12 being problematic if we 
take the position that it is uh, mariological. Uh, when we look at the Greek word, uh, well, let, let's first off say that, let, let's say that it's actually, well, let me tell you my position first, because otherwise it would be a convoluted mess if I ask you a question without you knowing. Uh, I believe that the woman is Mary. I have no problem with the dual image, imagery of the Mary and the church. I, I think that that fits even best, even better. But I think it is the mother Mary. I don't think it's a literal birth that is happening in Revelation 12 there in that particular verse where it talks about uh, travailing and pain. So uh, but with that being said, I believe it to be metaphorical, hearkening back to Simeon's sword, piercing Mary, Mary's soul. So with that, uh, with you knowing what I believe, I would like to ask you, if we look at the Greek of Revelation 12, where we read of anguish, torment, the particular Greek basanizo, uh, where is this ever used for uh, actual birth pains of a woman, whether in Scripture, the New Testament, or anywhere? Is it ever used for an actual literal birth of someone? You... Your question is whether or not the phrase that says, where it's, which translated in the King James, it says, and she being with child cried, tra travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Right. You're asking me if that's also right. used Greek, somewhere else. Right. The Greek for torment, is that ever used for an actual physical pain for woman in birth? The, the basanazo, that word? Or a different that's word? That's correct. Basanazo. Okay. I, I don't, I... Uh, I, I don't recall whether that's used somewhere else in in the literature for that. I, I'm not sure why it would be significant, but okay. I, I think it would be significant because I, I believe this figure to be Mary. And I believe if we read of the birth pains, I don't view them as literal, actual birth pains because it's using language that is metaphorical. I think that this fits a Mariological image. Let me ask you this. When it comes to the earliest interpretations of Revelation 12, are you aware that even fathers that have a, the position that it being the church, such as Methodius and others, admit that there are interpretations of Revelation 12 that predate them, that held it to be, quoting them, to be the Theotokos, Holy Mary? I, I seem to recall that, but, uh, you know, I, I don't, again, it's... Uh... I understand if you wouldn't agree with it. I just, I, I completely understand if you don't agree. I'm just trying to establish that an early interpretation of Revelation 12 of Mary as the woman here does indeed exist. You would at least admit that. I, I admit that there's a, an interpretation of this passage and interprets it as Mary, but that that passage wouldn't in any way, that interpretation wouldn't in any way establish bodily assumption of Mary. Uh, okay. I, I understand you don't believe it establishes a bodily assumption. I'm truly, simply trying to show that this is an early interpretation. Let me ask you this, because I got one minute left, and you can grill me on Revelation 12, because I do believe it does show us a bodily assumption. I have a minute left. Do you find it significant that among the apostolic churches, Syriac Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Ethiopic, Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholic, and all kinds of Catholic, that every single one of them believes in the bodily assumption of Mary. Is that not a strong attestation to what Pope Pius XII said about this dogma in one of his Antissimus days? It's a strong attestation as to his claim about what churches in the 1950s believed uh, and the fact that they continue to believe so now, what, about 63, 62 years later, it's not, uh, it, it continues so to be true. Be yeah. traced to an earlier, earlier than the 1950s in the Syriac or the Eastern Orthodox churches. Well, it, it can be traced earlier than that. Actually, much earlier than that. Even maybe a thousand years or more earlier than that. But it's still not in Scripture, and it's not uh, a legitimate tradition. All right, that wraps up that time. Okay, Francis, you now have 20 minutes to cross-examine William. Whenever you want to start. Just resetting my timer. Okay. Thank you very much for the, the constructive speech as well as for that uh, detailed cross-examination. My first question for you will be related to your opening uh, remarks. And you're, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the idea of Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Holy Mary. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
That's correct. Yes, I, 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 I make that case. I believe that to be ancient and biblical. Suppose for suppose I were to accept that idea that that in the scriptures the Mary that the ark symbol the symbol of the ark is a <clears throat> is somehow you know typifies or illustrates Mary. How how has that become relevant to bodily assumption? If uh -huh. and the way I understood you to, you tied it in was that in Revelation eleven the ark is in heaven. Yeah. So it's very relevant because first off, uh, Holy Mary is presented to us as a new ark of the new covenant. If we make the case for that, which I think Luke 1 is very clear, particular Greek words exclusively used in the presence of the ark are utilized for Mary. Then we look at Revelation 12 and we clearly see the ark is connected to the woman via the way the Greek is laid out. There's no doubt at all that this woman is the ark because of the vision that is being appeared, the vision appearing here. It's tied to the bodily assumption of Mary because of the particular Greek word used there, opse. You find that very same word used for the bodily resurrection sites when people see our Lord bodily risen from the dead. St. Paul uses that word. Revelation 11 and 12 use it over and over to talk about a bodily appearance. It's connected with the ark. We see the pinnacle of Mary as new ark in heaven come to fruition in Revelation 11 and 12. So I think that when the Pope hearken to Revelation 12, it's very clear why he did so. You recognize uh, the ancient pedigree of such an interpretation. So walk me through this a little bit more carefully. There, there sure. is a mention in Revelation 11, 11, 19, which is the last verse of 11 and yeah. chapter 12. As you said, the chapter divisions are, are subsequent mm -hmm. to the, the writing. Yeah. So it's immediately before the, the introduction of the woman. And it, is, it does mention that there's an ark of his testament in the temple of God. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but there's a shift. There is obviously a different picture between a picture of a temp, an ark and a picture of a woman with a, with, clothed with the sun and wearing a crown and so forth. Those are two different pictures. Will we agree on that so far? No, I don't agree. And the reason I don't agree is because of the way the, you even have New Testament scholars uh, that connect this. If you read um, the, the word biblical commentary, you will note how where we see uh, the Ark of the Covenant was seen. The particular Greek word is, is, is noted more than once, I think I believe three or four times over and over, to tie in this particular physical vi vision that is happening here. And what is that vision being tied in? The Ark is seen, Ophe. Now a great sign, which of course, that particular Greek word also utilized in Isaiah 7, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman. I, I truly believe they're connected. And I agree with the interpretation of Pascasius Radbertus in his homily in the Dormition. He interprets it, says that this is ancient. The church has interpreted it this way. That being Mary is the Ark of the Covenant here. So I, I think that it's very clearly laid out when you read it in a free flowing fashion, rather than reading 11, stopping at 11, then hopping to 12. It's very clear Mary here is being presented as the Ark of the Covenant. And rightly so, church, and then she is presented as an ark in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospel of St. Luke. In, in Revelation 12, 3, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Is it your position yeah. that the great red dragon is also Mary? Absolutely not. <laughs> My position would be that the great red dragon is that serpent of old. So this is the, the, the uh, fulfillment of what we read in Genesis 3, where the woman and the seed of the woman, the child, would be at enmity with the devil. And that is shown to be true in Revelation 12, where the devil is after the woman. So there are a number of images, a number of visions that are occurring here. None of them in, uh, how can I say, none of them showing just one clear image in a clear timeline. It's hopping back and forth to various events occurring. But no, there, there's no doubt at all that the red dragon is not Mary. It's the serpent of old. It identifies that serpent of old with Genesis 3, the uh, that serpent. I think, to me, Turretin fan, that's an even stronger Mariological connection if this is hearkening to that serpent of old from Genesis 3. Well, who is the mother of the Messiah in Genesis 3? It's none other than Mary. I don't think it's it's the, the Old Testament uh, Israel. I, 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 With all due respect, you're my friend, but I find that ludicrous. In, would you agree, though, that the word appeared, translated appeared there, is the same Greek word for appeared in Revelation 12.1 and the same one that says there was seen in the temple in Revelation 
That is definitely correct. So all of this is connected, but it's not connected to the same person because the great sign in his temple is the woman. So first off, we have a glorious image presented to us of the beautiful Ark of the Temple, the Ark of the Covenant. There's no way that what was seen being the Ark could be connected with Satan. How? If the Ark is being presented to us, opened in heaven, then immediately we rid of the woman, clove the crown of 12 stars, and then afterwards Satan. Satan would never be connected with such a beautiful and glorious image of uh, something frequently tied in with the Lord. I. I I, I don't find any logic in that. Aside from the word for to see, or that that word that's translated seen, is there another reason to link the this vision of the ark and the and the woman? You mentioned something about the Greek. Yeah. Was there another Greek word, or was that the Greek word you had in mind? Yeah. So there uh, there's a lot here. So also the very fact that. Um, it's not Old Testament Israel who, who was, were being told bore the male child. It's a female who bore the male child. This is hearkening to the Psalms. And in that particular Messianic Psalm, it's identifying the child that would rule the nations with a rod of iron as being Christ. This is uh, if she gave birth to this woman here, to the one that is the Messiah, is our incarnate God. I think that's a pretty strong indication this is Mary. The other indication that would be Mary is where we read... Uh, toward, I think towards the end of it, where it talks about those that keep the commandments of our Lord uh, being her children. It doesn't mean literal offspring. And I think it's a direct parallelism to what John says at the foot of the cross, tying in Mary as the mother of the church. I believe it to be the same author. In Revelation 12, 5, it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Would you agree that her child that was caught up to God and to his throne is Jesus, not Mary? Correct. And no one else in this whole passage is said to be caught up to, to God and to his throne, correct? Uh, no one else is presented to us as the messianic figure from the Psalms. Uh, absolutely, that would only be Christ. And the there's a reference at verse 14. It says, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Yeah. Do you agree that this is not a reference to anyone going to heaven? Um, that's tough. That's certainly not the way Ephraim viewed it. I believe Ephraim interpreted that um, in, a, in a very similar to the way the Pope laid out the Assumption dogma. So uh, you have some fathers that interpreted this as Mary being uh, carried away because of that particular language and utilized it for assumption language. But uh, whether or not that particular language is referring to her being bodily present in heaven, uh, I think the more important thing than anything else, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think the most important thing is that woman here is Mary. Regardless if in that section she's in heaven or not, she's identified as Mary here because that enmity that mortal warfare, as that Greek word is indicative in Genesis 3, carries on into Revelation 12. And she's protected, and that Barry remains. The devil never gets Mary in his clutches. So this passage as well shows the strong Mariological connection. I think anyway, we look in Revelation 12, it's very clear that Mary is a woman here. The, it says that the serpent, ca uh, in Revelation 12, 15, it says, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. It would it be possible for the serpent, the devil, to attack Mary while she was in heaven, if she were indeed in heaven at this time? Uh, no matter what, whether Mary would be physically in the glorious heaven here or in the heavens, nothing could have harmed the woman, as you can see right there. What does it say? The woman was helped by the earth. And anything you read, uh, the woman is never affected in a negative fashion. Indeed, how does it end? The dragon is enraged. He's never able to do anything to Mary. As Genesis 3, the prophecy has come to fulfillment. He can never harm Mary, um, as Catholics believe, because Mary's immaculate. She'd never be in the clutches of the devil ever. So what does he do? He goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. Thus, just as Pope Pius XII says, Mary is also a figure of the mother of the church here. So it's perfectly fine to also view this as 
an image of the church, only that the early fathers viewed it as Mary being representative of the church as well. A twofold interpretation is perfectly fine here. And again, in Revelation 12, 16, as I think you may have just acknowledged, what the the helper of the woman against this flood unleashed by the serpent is the earth. And the, would you agree that the earth is not in heaven? Yeah, as I said earlier, we have a number of things that are occurring. We have a number of, of uh, shifting in timeline. So uh, we don't have one clear thing of every single thing happening here in heaven. Indeed, even the devil is cast out of heaven. So uh, was the devil ever in heaven at one point? There's no doubt. So it's conflating a number of events that happened throughout history. Uh, this particular part where it talks about the earth protecting the woman would then rewind beforehand and talk about how Mary was protected while she uh, lived on earth. So I want to be very clear here. There's a number of things that happen in Revelation 12 that are not all in a clear, perfect timeline of events that happen in history. It goes back and forth multiple times. This is what John does over and over. But the most important thing that John does do in Revelation 12, actually Revelation 11, is he talks about a something physically seen, opfe, something physically seen. And what is that? The Ark of the Covenant. Well, who's the Ark of the Covenant? It is the woman. He presents something beautiful and then ties it in with something beautiful. The woman with a crown of 12 stars, thuz, representative of the 12 nations, she is the mother of the church. What is the earliest non-heretical writing that mentions this bodily assumption of Mary that, you, <clears throat> that you're aware of or that you were using in, your, in, in this debate? Yeah, so uh, first off, there would be the book of Mary's repose. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, in Latin. There are a number of different ones. There's a Syriac one. There's a Greek one where uh, the Reverend Dr. Shoemaker will, will argue that this is, um, has a second century origin. Dr. Daly, Reverend Dr. Daly will say this uh, as well, has a second century origin. It is apostolic, they say. Excuse me. So we could point to that very early document talking about Mary being bodily assumed. Then when we go to early church fathers, you don't have a lot speculating on the end of Mary's life until you get to early on Ephraim the Syrian, who does clearly talk about Mary being bodily assumed into heaven. By the time people begin to speculate on Mary's end, they realize this has been divinely handed down. Mary was body and soul assumed into heaven, which is why we have an early council, we have early church fathers, and you don't have any opposition to this. It even enters into the liturgy. East, West, Syriac Church. Um, uh, this is as unanimous as you can get early on. So when you mention the Book of Mary's Repose as the earliest witness of this, who is the author of that book? We don't know. Uh, Dr. Shoemaker says it's an early Christian community. What he does say is he does say that this is extremely different from the heretical pseudo Melito that would pop up much later. So again, if we're talking about texts that have been condemned much later, by the way, those texts that you spoke of being condemned, when you read them, they acknowledge there were writings that predate them. So we look at these particular texts and like the Proto-Evangelium of James, though not scriptural, though pseudonymous, it is indicative of the early Christian community believing Mary fell asleep, a holy falling asleep, and was bodily assumed into heaven. And these were not heretical or any, or the early fathers would not have said, look, this was recognized by the early Christian community. So this is recognized early on. So who's the, aside from uh, Shoemaker, who's obviously not ancient, who, what's the ancient uh, father or council that, that ex accepted this book as, an, as a reliable account? So, um, you don't have any councils dealing with uh, apocryphal books. I'm not aware of any council that would say this is our testimony. So th that actually is a fantastic question, Turretin Van, because that book is not the basis for our belief in Mary being bodily assumed. The belief is, as you quoted him earlier, O'Carroll says, this is divinely revealed. So it's clearly alluded to, very strongly pointed to in Revelation 12. And in Psalm 132 as well, I disagree with your interpretation of Psalm 132. 
also in Psalm 132, it's alluded to there. Uh, the Council of Nisibis talks about this being known to the church and then says, doesn't quote heretical documents, says, we imagine, it, I imagine, Jacob says, that this is what happened when Mary was taken body into heaven. They weren't there. They weren't eyewitnesses, but it was handed down through the deposit of faith. And they begin to provide poetic imagery of what would have happened when Mary is greeted body and soul into heaven. So the councils don't hearken to any apocryphal documents. The fathers don't hearken to any apocryphal documents. They don't need them. It was already part of the deposit of faith. So it, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit odd to, to expect if the, uh, if these councils and fathers who are coming to the conclusion that Mary was bodily assumed, not, if they don't make reference to books like the Book of Virgin of the Virgin Mary's Repose, it's not uh, it's not that they say that they didn't get it from there, and it's not that they said that they did get it from there. They just simply don't specify where they got it from. Correct. Um. I, I was never part of my argument that these apocryphal books were the origin of this teaching. So there's no way any of them would ever point to an apocryphal text as being the origin. What they point to is the deposit of faith. This was part of the liturgy. You look at the Gregorian sacramentary, the venerable sacramentary, it's part of the liturgy. They're not going to point to any apocryphal text, just like the perpetual virginity of Mary doesn't originate in the Proto-Evangelium of James. But the early Christian community already recognizes it and is already teaching it. So, of course, they're not going to point to it. Even the Council of Nisibis, which, by the way, tons of bishops there, not a single one objected to this belief. You could have had an outcry because in the early church, Turretin fam, if anything was contrary to Scripture, such as the Arian heresy, you'd have people rise up. You'd have them condemn it or say, hey, where did that come from? But you don't have people ever arising and saying, hey, uh, this doesn't come from anywhere. This is just uh, made up. This is heretical. And as we see in Epiphanius, who originally was agnostic to this, once he does go and do research, once he does do hunting, as he, he calls it himself, he reaches a conclusion of Mary in his final mention of her in Panarium 79. And that conclusion is that Mary was bodily translated into heaven. So in the in the book of Mary, of the Virgin Mary's Repose, as translated by uh, Shoemaker, it states, John said to him, when I go forth to teach and preach, I will say that anyone who is not a virgin all of his days will not be able to see God. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say that that represents the teachings of Christian Orthodoxy or is this the teachings of no. a Christian heretical sect? Yeah, that's a big problem that you're encountering there because what you're reading is you're reading the translation of one of the documents that was condemned. Now, that one was particularly condemned. The one that I'm referring to, there are multiple ones. And indeed, I imagine you're reading from Shoemaker's translation, Turretin Van. Go to the page where he actually has the chart laid out. And that text you just quoted is heretical. Above it, you have a chart throughout history, a timeline of this belief and that particularly heretical document is mentioned as breaking testimonial tradition, not part of the earliest texts. But there are some that predate that much simpler, much shorter, that don't have any fantastical kind of language like that. <clears throat> when we realize this is already present in the early church, not in heretical texts, we realize the early community already believed in this. It had a strong basis. And I agree with the scholars, clearly an apostolic origin, as the allusions are laid out in Psalm 132 and in Revelation 12. Is it your position that the earliest form of this writing, the Book of Mary's Repose, does not contain heresy? That is definitely my position. I think the earliest form of it is much shorter. And let me add to that, there's not a living scholar the Reverend Dr. Daly, uh, the Reverend Dr. Coppice, who've examined it, or even Dr. Shoemaker, who believe the origin of that is Gnostic. Even the heretical document itself talks about texts that predated it. It cannot be the origin of it. All right. Thank you very much. We're now going to move into our time of um, Q&A. 
I've got a bunch of questions here. So I was thinking what we could do is I could direct the question to whoever is it's being directed to. Maybe if you guys could try to take about two minutes each to respond so we can get through these. And if you're watching this live right now, please uh, put a question in the, in the live chat uh, and tell me who you want the question directed to. And uh, we'll be right as bloody rain. All right, let's go through some of these here. Born Again RN. Now you're gonna help, have to help me with <coughs> some of this uh, pronunciation here, uh, or at least uh, how to, let's see. For William, why didn't Tertullian mention Mary's bodily assumption in his work, Resurrection of the Dead, in 63 chapters like he did others raised, resurrected like Enoch, Elijah, etc.? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I appreciate that. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, Tertullian doesn't mention. Uh, Tertullian not mentioning a particular thing doesn't mean that he wasn't aware of it. Or it could have been that he was not aware of it. Or it could have also been that he was aware of it and he rejected it. It's also very likely Tertullian rejected very key aspects. Actually, it's not possibility. It's a definite. He rejected key aspects of Christology, of the doctrine of the Trinity, and he was an outright heretic, condemned. He formally left the church. It's possible he knew of it, rejected it, or that he didn't know about it. At the end of the day, Tertullian's name was never in the diptych. Tertullian was never a saint. And agnosticism is something, it does not equate a denial of something. Uh, what's your response there, Francis? There's... It's, of course, an argument from silence, and I appreciate the question. It's, the argument is something like this. If Tertullian is setting out to list the people he knows of who have been translated, then, and he is mentioning Enoch and Elijah, then why on earth would he not mention Mary if he believed that Mary had been translated? And as William said, there's, we can give different possible reasons why he might not do it. But I think one natural reason is that this was not something he was, this view was not something that he was familiar with, or if he was familiar with it, it was not something that he personally held to. It would be just kind of surprising for him to omit it. Is it an absolute proof? Of course not. It's just an explanation of the silence. But I think it's a reasonable explanation of that silence. All right. Uh, we got a question here from Anthony, thank you for the super chat. This is for you, Francis. He says, for what reason do you believe the dragon and the sun in Revelation can represent both multiple things and individual people, but the woman can only be symbolic of the church? I don't necessarily say that thing that there, I'm not trying to be dogmatic that the woman can only be symbolic of the church. My, my biggest problem is even if the woman is symbolic of Mary, in kind of a you know on the nose uh, representation of Jesus' mother, she has other children in the text. She isn't caught up to heaven with her son; only her son is caught up to heaven. She suffers childbirth pains, which contradicts the one of the uh, doc dogmas uh, related to the perpetual virginity. And as I said, she has other children. So all in all, this is not the Mary of Pope Pius the Twelfth, even if it were otherwise Mary. But I think the better way to understand this is that it is a vision and that the woman represents the Old Testament church, that the devil is the, represented by the dragon. The text is pretty explicit about that. And the uh, the children are, you know, the believers. There's there is one, you know, best understanding of this text. I don't I'm not saying that texts can't have multiple meanings. Uh, there are certainly some examples of ancient prophecies that had an immediate meaning and a subsequent meaning. Uh, but yeah. That's, that's the reason for why I reject the idea that this refers to Mary. William, you respond? Yeah, I believe it very clearly does uh, refer to Mary. And I think that if we look at the earliest fully extant Greek commentaries in Revelation, that does come out. Uh, look at Oikumenias, where he clearly even, he says a double vision is permissible to hold it, being the woman and the church, because Mary is the mother of the church. So. Uh, as I said, uh, Revelation 12 doesn't need to be in a particular uh, timeline. It goes back and forth. But what is very clearly connected is the Greek word, remember, that opse, that word is used for the bodily resurrection to indicate an appearance of a true body. Revelation 11 ties the a beautiful archon with the beautiful woman wearing the crown 
that clearly is tied into Mary. And uh, the birth pains is no problem at all. Paul in Galatians 4 talks about travailing in pain, uses the same Greek word, odonusa. Are we going to, you know, that's a bit of a problem that we take that to be literal. It's clearly referring back to Simeon's prophecy, the sword that would pierce the soul of Mary, because it is Mary. That other Greek word that we talked about, basinisa, never used for actual physical pain in giving childbirth. So this metaphorical kind of anguish Holy Mary is going through, and that anguish we know occurs because the son does die. Um, so I, I think that it very clearly does refer to Mary, but I have no problem holding to, as the early church did, a double vision of that. What I do have a problem with, and I'm glad my friend Turton fan recognizes that there's, there are texts that predate what has been condemned by probably pseudo-Galatius, probably wasn't Pope Galatius himself, but it was condemned by Aramistus. Um, and I hope at least today we put that really old 1990s argument to rest. This is why I love debating Turton fan. He is always excelling and learning scholarly things, never stops reading and learning, uh, because we realize that the, the, the heretical text condemned in the pseudo-Galatian decree and Hormizdus is not the text that the church hearkens to when talking about an early second century witness. Okay, William, this question is from Colin. He says, why would the New Testament authors be completely silent on a doctrine which your church made a foundational belief to Christianity? Yeah, thank you very much for that, Colin. I want to be very clear that uh, it is not just my church, my friend. Uh, go look at an interview I did with Orthodox scholars. Look at an interview I did with an incredible, amazing gentleman by the name of Subdeacon Daniel. Um, and my interview with a Reverend Dr. Ramsey, good friend of mine. I've debated it here on this channel before. Eastern Orthodox, Syriac Orthodox, they will tell you, we cannot deny this. This is a part of our faith. It's not just part of the Catholic faith. And I would argue... The New Testament authors are not completely silent on that because I believe St. John, the author of the Gospel of St. John, was the author of St. John's Apocalypse. I truly, strongly believe that with the parallelism of many Greek words utilized that only St. John did utilize. And if that is the case, they are not completely silent. It is very clearly laid out in Revelation 12. Go for it, Francis, if you want to respond. Sure. Yeah, I, I do think it is problematic. I don't, I don't agree that although these other churches teach the same idea or a similar idea, you'll sometimes see Orthodox authors try to distinguish between their view of Mary's Dormition versus the Western view of her Assumption. You'll see them make that kind of argument, uh, which goes really beyond the scope of our, our debate here. They don't have the same dogmatic weight behind that teaching as uh, Roman Catholicism does. And for example, I, it will be hard pressed to find someone who will say that the wrath of Almighty God is incurred if you deny this in the in the Orthodox Church. Maybe you will find someone. I don't know. Perhaps uh, perhaps there is someone who does that, but I, I have yet to see that myself. In any event, I, it is pr a pretty serious claim that God's wrath will be incurred by something that isn't actually taught in Scripture. And I, I think we've demonstrated that it isn't taught. All right. This question is for you, Francis. Um, can you elaborate on why you think that whether Mary died or not is a conflict for the Assumption dogma? The, pro the issue of whether Mary died or not is problematic for the Assumption dogma because the Assumption dogma is a historical claim. It's not a historical claim that's supported by a scriptural account. So the Elijah's translation, Enoch's translation, both have a historical account. That, and in both cases, we know that the men didn't see death. They were translated. We have the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, which differs from Elijah and Enoch, because he died, he was buried, he rose again on the third day. Those are things that the scriptures teach. The question of whether Mary died or not has to come from extra scriptural tradition because scripture doesn't say it. It, it and that's i quoted one of the fathers who talked about it but the scripture doesn't tell us whether that she it doesn't specifically say she died or it doesn't specifically say she's still alive now i don't know anyone who believes that she's still alive here on earth there are people who think that about john but there's the claim is that she is assumed into heaven that we know this divinely and yet we have conflicting accounts of whether she even died or not. There are people who say she did die, 
but God wouldn't let her body be corrupted, so her body was taken away. Then there's accounts that s seem to suggest that she was raised again from the from the dead. In that case, it's not just that the body is taken away, but the body is rejoined with the soul and taken away. Or there's there's accounts that say she never died; she's just taken away uh, without dying. And those are three different conflicting views. Theirs are not uh, one in the same view, and it just helps to demonstrate that there wasn't actually an original apostolic tradition on which this was founded. It... Thanks, William. Yeah, I, I don't think it to be problematic at all, Kyle. Uh, and thank you for uh, for that incredible question. Uh, the death of uh, Holy Mary is not problematic. I tend to lean uh, towards Mary having a holy falling asleep. Um, uh, as, as the Eastern Catholic churches hold to the Byzantine churches and uh, our, our Syriac and our Eastern brothers and sisters. Um, I think of that pretty much is virtually almost a unanimous account. Even if we look at Timothy of Jerusalem, Modestus and Epiphanius, uh, no matter what, even if you read of an immortal Mary, you can uh, probably extrapolate the fact that they're talking about her living eternally in heaven and body. It doesn't indicate that they believe she never did die. Um, in the dogma itself, it leaves that open uh, to question. But Pius, if you read the rest of it, uh, he does himself reach a conclusion. He believes that she did die, despite it not being part of the actual dogmatic decree. I want to be very clear about that. Um, why do a lot of fathers wonder? Well, the very fact that they were not presently there to eyewitness it, but the fact that this has virtually unanimous testimony. Remember, in Scripture, the best illusion to the holy death and bodily rising of Mary is in Psalm 132. Go look at the Dormition accounts of how the fathers interpreted Psalm 132, Mary as a new ark, and then go look at Revelation 12. There's a very clear reason why the early church had no problem with this. Unlike other teachings that, uh, such as the canon of scripture where there was a little bit of bumping of heads, you don't ever have bumping of heads of the bodily assumption of Mary. It was part of the liturgy for very good reason. There is no conflict. And, uh, it, we very clearly see this is of apostolic origin. Okay, this question, and uh, honestly, I can just be, if I could just add my own two cents here, I'm sort of sympathetic to the Protestant who asks a question like this. It's like, look, I'm a Protestant Christian, they say, I want to be faithful to what the Word of God teaches, and what you're pointing to, yeah. just it just seems too vague, too ethereal, too open to interpretation, right? And so I, I, see, I'd love you to kind of speak to that as well as you answer this question. Why do you think it's a firm foundation to develop theology based off typology? Shouldn't we develop theology based off clear teachings of Scripture? That, that, that to me is a fantastic question, Matt, 100%. Number one, uh, today what we've dealt with typology in Psalm 132. Remember that that typology was quoted by St. Peter in the book of Acts. The typology, he pointed to that to talk about the bodily resurrection in the very Psalm 132 that I'm quoting from, where it talks about the Lord arising, using the Greek word for arising. Well, Peter uh, based the, the, the deep foundation of the bodily resurrection by saying, look, it was hearkened to way back here. That's incredibly powerful. Secondly, I think it rises above mere typology in Revelation 12. And even if we only had a mere typology, I want to be very clear. The ancient apostolic churches do not rely or operate upon sola scripturum. And if they did operate upon that, it would be problematic. They hold to scripture and divine tradition. If we do look very clearly in the, I mean, let's be very clear. When did Mary die? Probably didn't die when the gospel writers were writing their accounts. So of course it won't be recorded. And probably you don't have it recorded to the book of Revelation for bodily assumption because of the date of it actually occurring. Early fathers even speculate upon that. That is why once we do get to the apostolic church era and later on in history, they do begin to talk about it more and more and talk about it as being part of the deposit of faith. Now, Jay, I don't know his full name. I want to put your mind a little bit at ease and ask you, don't just rely upon what Pope Pius says. Go look at what the Oriental Orthodox say. Go look at what the Eastern Orthodox say. They might not say, well, our patriarch or what have you has defined it as a dogma, but ask him, are you bound to believe this? They will tell you, oh, it's part of our liturgy. It is divinely instituted. And that is the very belief that Catholics hold to this day. Francis? I do agree that it's dangerous to develop theology based off of typology, especially when that typology lacks 
scriptural warrant. When you simply draw parallels between two different accounts and say, well, there's this parallel and that parallel and the next parallel, you run, you run into the risk of your own creativity becoming your standard of truth. Because it's simply a matter of how creative you are, how many parallels you can find between two things. We see this problem in some modern sermons where people will take you know, uh, the Star Wars movie and find all these Christological parallels and bring out the you know, Christ types from Star Wars. And that's not warranted. May, there may indeed be some, liter you know, some thematic borrowing going on, but that's not the, w the right way to understand Star Wars. And it's not the right way to understand scripture just by imposing your ideas onto scripture, finding parallels and drawing out those parallels that you believe are there without some scriptural warrant for making those parallels in the first place. And that's one of the differences between a tethered view of typology, one like the School of Antioch typically employed, and an untethered view, which is often associated with Origen, although uh, perhaps Origen wasn't as free with his typology as people have accused him. So yes, I, I generally agree with Jay's uh, comment. Now, here's a question that really goes beyond the scope of this debate, Francis, so feel free to dismiss it. but. It was asked and I was looking for a question and here's what came up and surely you've heard of it. Why accept the authority of the Catholic Church to teach the canon of scripture but reject the same authority when it teaches the assumption? We don't have to go down that road if you don't want. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it, uh, Alexandros. Uh, obviously, since I reject the deuterocanonical books as being the word of God, I don't accept the authority of the Council of Trent uh, to, uh, to, to decide the canon of scripture or to promulgate the canon of scripture and i don't accept the scripture because the roman catholic church tells me that that's the scripture although i do appreciate the work of the pre-reformation church in preserving the scripture as well as i do also appreciate the work of unbelieving jews who preserved the hebrew text of the old testament scriptures during the same period uh, i don't I invest the unbelieving jews with uh, authority because they preserved the scriptures and I don't uh, invest the Council of Trent or any of the earlier councils that talked about scripture or any of the earlier uh, Christian writers whether it's Jerome who has a more similar view or uh, or the opponents of Jerome which had a uh, more a view more similar to that of Trent so uh, no I don't accept the authority of the Roman Catholic Church to teach the canon of scripture and therefore it's not uh, inconsistent for me to then reject that authority when it comes to the assumption. Alexandros, uh, that is a fantastic question. And I think the reason, I think what he actually wanted to ask was, um, he might have phrased it a little better. He meant uh, why accept the church's authority to decide uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to guide them to decide which scriptures were apostolic. And indeed, Alexandros, you are correct. Even though today our Protestant friends reject the Deuterocanonical books and then some, even though that is definitely the case, uh, at the end of the day, there is no way that they know that their books that they've got in their arm uh, should be considered holy writ, other than the very fact that the earliest time gathering in council, Council of Rome 382, Hippo and Carthage 393, 397, and it wasn't Trent, it was Florence, which ecumenically uh, dealt with the, the, the canon of Scripture, other than those gatherings of Scripture where it has the Old Testament and New Testament, by what basis does a Protestant know that these are scriptural? Not all the old, not all the old Testament books are quoted in the New, so there's a massive problem there. They've got to look to the early church. And when they do look to the early church, that very same early church that was unanimous in the bodily assumption of Holy Mary is the very same early church that canonized scripture. And when it canonized scripture, it contained the deuterocanonical books. Indeed, every time the church gathered in council to list the books of scripture, never throughout history were any of the deuterocanonicals ever lacking all throughout history. That very same church is the one that unanimously believed in Mary being bodily assumed. And I think that that is something incredibly powerful. We don't need to have it laid out piece by piece in scripture when it's very clearly strongly shown a vision in revelation 12 and then attested to by very early traditions that can be dated to the apostolic era 
Well, no doubt Francis would have a lot to say in response to that, but given that this is the Sola Scriptura debate, we might leave that for another video. But uh, let's get to one more question here. This is, again, comes from Born Again RN. Uh, and Willie, as I read this, it'd be great if you could kind of re-articulate it to help those at home understand what, what they're asking. Uh, Pope Galatius I anathematized anyone believing in the bodily assumption of Mary without separating the dogma from the transitus writings. Would he, the Pope in 1950, anathematize each other? Yeah, let me lay it down again. And I think that that's so important. Um, uh, let me scroll up because I don't remember it off the top of my head, but um, let me lay it out. What Munificentissimus Deus clearly lays out dogmatically that it has been revealed by God that Mary, the immaculate, perpetually virgin mother of God, after the completion of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into the glory of heaven. Every father you read talk about it, they don't say, oh, it's only the soul. It's body and soul, clearly laid out there by Ephraim, clearly bodily in Revelation 12. Thus, the Greek word opthe for a bodily vision connecting the ark and the woman. So I wanted to lay that out first. And then I want to get to this. This is very, very old uh, argumentation, born again, that comes from no living scholar other than William Webster, which with all due respect, I do not consider a scholar. Look at Reverend Dr. Daly, Reverend Dr. Coppice, Dr. Shoemaker. None of them will make this argument. It is not a good argument. First off, that document was not written by Pope Galatius, born again. It is very likely to be pseudo-Galatius. It did anathematize the heretical transitist writing. But as we've been talking about throughout this whole debate, the church doesn't hearken to the documents that have been condemned. So let me point out one more thing, because we talked about it during cross-examination. The fathers that talk about the Dormition, born again, and the bodily assumption, they're very clear. They say it themselves. They say, we recognize these, this text that was condemned, and they are very clear. We don't rely on that for our belief. John of Thessalonica says that. Gerho of Reichsburg says that. And Ambrose of Outpert clearly note these texts that were condemned are not the ones that we rely upon when we talk about early Christian communities that believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. So my brief response is, I appreciate the, you know, bringing up the question of the condemnation of these early writings. And I actually, I think this would have been a nice twist on the previous question, because this is the, you know, the purported authority of Galatius. And as William said, there's some question about who exactly came up with these condemnations. They were later accepted. The condemnations were later accepted, but the, uh, whether he is originally the person who came up with it is something that's a, a matter of some dispute and uh, some, there's some reason to think that he isn't the original author. However, the, uh, the condemnations here are not necessarily the condemnations of every single teaching that's in each one of these writings. Instead, it's a list of apocryphal books. I think that the bigger concern we should have here, though, is it goes back to what William ended up having to say, or maybe I shouldn't say having to say, what he ended up saying, which is that he thought that the first form of the Book of Mary's Repose didn't include heretical content. I think that's where we have a problem if we say that the original of that book was an Orthodox book and that it later became uh, condemned as the work of heretics by Rome Yet we were supposed to trust Rome now to to uh, uh, dogmatize the doctrine. I think that is more problematic. And yes, I agree that they didn't. Uh, you know, these councils don't say, "Oh, we got it from that book that's also condemned." Uh, but you know, that, I don't see much particular uh, value in that observation, except to say that they didn't cite their sources. And I'll, I'll stop there. I hear myself echoing through. Sorry about that. Oh no, you sound good on this end. I don't hear that at all. Yeah, I don't hear that. Okay, let's do a okay, final good. question. This comes from one of our local supporters, uh, Mitchell Godfrey. He says, William, is it okay for a Catholic to not understand or maybe even not care deeply about the Marian dogma as long as they truly submit uh, that the church is right about them? Could I tell a Protestant interested in Catholicism to not get hung up on a Marian uh, 
the assumption if they are willing to generally submit to the church's authority? It's a good question because, uh, you know, Catholics yeah. like me get super intense about the Blessed Virgin Mary. I love her. Yeah. I pray to her. I, 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 I want to make her known. Um, but, you know, some of that is a matter of temperament and just personal piety that I wouldn't want to foist on anybody else. So just what, what do you say generally to that? Before I reply, I want to let the audience know one thing. Uh, before the debate, Matt never once told me to say what I'm about to say, but I recommend people do what they can do to get a hold of one of these. This is the best mug I've ever drank. <laughs> out of. It's an incredible mug. And I see one back there behind Matt, and I will then now reply to that and tell them. When I became Catholic and I converted and I became Catholic, I confess to many people that I had problems with the Marian dogmas because you, know, you go from your whole life uh, being a Reformed Protestant and having um, this different kind of belief when it comes to marrying, that what I did, uh, my friend, was I said, okay, look, well, the church is right about the canon and the church is right about the canon. The church is right about all these other teachings, justification, infant baptism, baptism regeneration. Um, and about Mary being the mother of God, Christology. They got the Trinity right. I'm going to submit to the authority of the church, and I'm going to dig, dig and dig and research more and more. And I did do that. I dug more and more, and I eventually got to the point that the very first book that I authored, I co-authored with my dear friend, uh, the Reverend Dr. Coppice, was on Mariology. My love for Holy Mary is incredibly strong uh, because it points everyone to her son, and it should deepen your love for Christ. So I'll tell you, if you feel convicted to become Catholic, become Catholic and uh, do do more deep research. I promise you that you're eventually going to open your heart to uh, to Holy Mary. Francis, here's an I, I'm going to get get you, you feel free to respond however you like. But here's a question for you that I'd be interested in. It's it's, it's a different kind of question. Uh, what could Catholics do better? Uh, to, you know, to help our Protestants hear us more. I, I remember once hearing Dr. William Lane Craig saying, okay, Catholics, I hear you say you don't worship the Blessed Virgin Mary, and I'm willing to accept that, but you have to understand as a Protestant, when I walk into a church and I see a, a forest of candles ablaze in front of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it kind of looks like that to us. So obviously at the end of the day, you're going to reject those teachings that we say Catholics must believe. But I don't know. It, how could Catholics do a better job at not freaking Protestants out as they seek to talk about their devotion to her? Is that a fair question? Wow. Uh, all right. Well, yes, I, I think I, I encountered a similar question on a on a reformed uh, social media site, I think yesterday or the day before. And it had a list of, you know, Stop you! I think the, the the meme was something like "Stop using anti-Catholic language." Stop saying that Catholics worship Mary because we don't. Stop saying that the the Pope is perfect because that's not Catholic doctrine and these kinds of things. So, uh, you know, some of it, uh, some of it is you know the Protestant characterization of the Roman Catholic position. So we would we would say if you're praying to Mary and you're lighting candles to her and you have little. Uh, I forget the right term for it, but little statues of Mary set up with flowers and everything else for people to pray at throughout your city, as I've seen in, in you know, cities in Catholic countries, you know, that looks a lot like, and it quacks a lot like a duck. So it, it you know, there's a reason why people say that looks like worshiping a Mary. Uh, on the other hand, you know, things like, is the Pope perfect? That That's kind of set aside by having to carefully explain to people what's actually taught, which is just that the Pope is infallible when he speaks from the chair of Peter, when he's speaking ex cathedra, not uh, just every time, not when he's ordering his breakfast, not, you know, there's there's a lot of nuance that has to go in. And it's tough to explain nuance to people, of course. Uh, but, and as well, there's also the other side, which is that one of the Protestant criticisms of papal infallibility is that it's such a, a narrow claim that it, it seems like it's saying he's infallible except when he's not, which, you know, that, <laughs> To our ears, that doesn't sound, that sounds like such a, you know, I mean, in this case, the, the, of that entire 48 paragraph document, there's one line that's supposedly infallible from that whole thing. And there's hardly any documents that are supposedly infallible, depending on who you ask. So uh, anyway, so, so I guess long story short, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how not to freak out Protestants. <laughs> I do think that we should, I think we should be focused on the truth. I, I, I'm not one of these people who says, I, obviously I don't agree with what 
Pope Pius said, and he did say that if you deny, willfully deny or call into doubt this doctrine, you've fallen completely away from the Catholic, the divine and Catholic faith. So according to him, I've fallen completely away from the divine and Catholic faith. Uh, baptized, I'm, I'm baptized as in, in accounts, according to you know, his understanding of baptism, but I've completely fallen away from the divine and Catholic faith by denying this doctrine. But, you know, obviously that as the question, the previous question asked, do you have to believe it or just have to uh, accept the authority of the church? Well, the way that it's written here, you don't have to say you agree with it. You just can't deny it. It's a, a little bit it is a nuanced difference, but it is a diff, it's a real difference. I mean, there's not a claim here. You have to even know about it. You just can't deny it uh, in order to not fall you know, prey to that. Thing. So I think we should focus on the truth. And I think these debates give a good opportunity for that. Because if I say, if I characterize the Catholic teaching one way, William can come back and say, uh, not, not quite, you know, we, there's a little, we have a little different view. So Terrific. I find these very useful and I appreciate you hosting this. Yeah, this has been fun. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. So we're going to do five minute closings. We'll have William go first and then Francis will have the final word since William began the debate. Uh, so whenever you want to, whenever you want to begin, William. Let me get my timer. I apologize for that. Yeah. And I will begin now. Thank you very much for that. I think this debate um, shows a lot of things. Number one, it shows that uh, when the Pope hearkened to Holy Writ, he was very clear and, as to how the early church interpreted Scripture. Everywhere you look in the early church, you have this belief present. Now, we were asked, well, why uh, would a dogma rest upon typology? It doesn't. But you can look to typology. Arise, O Lord, and your ark of holiness. How was this interpreted in divine scripture? St. Peter interpreted that to be in reference to the bodily resurrection. By the time we get to the Dormition and the Assumption accounts, Hezekiah of Jerusalem, Andrew of Crete, Germanus, St. John, they interpret it as being Mariological as well. Now, why? Because Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. Now, we weren't challenged on that, and for good reason. In Luke 1, there's a number of Greek words, one particular word utilized for the exclaiming of Elizabeth that is used in the presence of Mary only ever used before the ark in the greek bible this is why the early church the earliest interpretations of who the ark of the new covenant was was a mariological one mary is the new ark and that new ark reaches its pinnacle of beauty in a bodily vision remember that greek word of that bodily vision in heaven the greek uranos Mary is the woman of Revelation 12. We were asked, well, uh, how, could, how could this be Mary? Uh, well, there's only one person that gave birth to the Messiah, and it would not be Old Testament Israel. There's no possible way this could be Old Testament Israel. It is Mary. And just like St. John, who entrusts her to the care of the apostle in the gospel account, our Lord entrusts her to the care of the beloved disciple, says this is your mother she's the mother of the church there but she's presented directly as the mother of the church in revelation 12 of all believers those that keep the commandments of our lord only one could give birth to the one that would rule the nations with a rod of iron that is holy mary the earliest interpretations even those that say we prefer an interpretation of it being the church but we recognize those before us interpreted either as being completely the Theotokos or Mary and the church. It is a Mariological passage attested to in the early church. We heard about, uh, her we've heard about heretical documents over and over. It was my desire for this debate to finally end that argument that we have to rely upon pseudonymous texts that were condemned by the popes over and over. No, they weren't. I want you to open up, get the book from Reverend Dr. Daly or buy it online, put control F, look for Melito, pseudo Melito. You'll find it one time because the dogma does not rest upon that. If you read the oldest text that they argue is second century apostolic belief in the early community, it doesn't have any of this heretical documentation. 
that later texts would have. And indeed, as I said, how can anyone make the argument that pseudo Melito was the origin if upon opening the book, it tells you that there are books that predate it? There is no parallelism. I quoted a bunch of early fathers. Which one of them relied on these heretical texts? Zero. Which council, the Council of Nisibis, did it rely upon this documented heretical text? No, none of them do. They tell you this is part of the ancient deposit of faith, the apostolic deposit of faith, and indeed it is. And we heard about Epiph Epiphanius earlier as a strong evidence of agnosticism of Mary's end. Well, when he does do research, he comes back and says, Mary was translated like Elijah. There's no way around the Greek there. There is no way around it. Every scholar to look at it, every Dormition and Mariological scholar, Dr. Coppice, Dr. Daly, Dr. Shoemaker, all tell you he reached a conclusion that Mary was bodily assumed. And indeed, we should reach that conclusion because it is an ancient teaching that all of the apostolic churches hold to. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, William. And uh, Francis, if you, whenever you want to begin, I'll, I'll click the timer. It's five minutes, correct? That's right. Thank you so much. It has been a lively and interesting debate, and I really appreciate it. The subject of the debate is a question of what happened to Mary. Scripture doesn't tell us specifically her end, although Scripture gives us the general principle, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since, man came, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Mary is one of Christ's, she will also be be raised to life at Christ's coming. That's what the general principle of scripture teaches, and we haven't been given a compelling reason to find an exception to that. Revelation 12, we're told it's about Mary, but it doesn't mention anything about a bodily assumption there. There, we, there was, Even if we accepted that it's about Mary and not about the Old Testament church, which has its own problems, but even so, it doesn't talk about Mary being assumed. The only person that's taken up into heaven is Jesus in that chapter, not the woman. Moreover, we looked at the scripture that was used by Pope Pius to support this, and William uh, echoed his uh, comment about Psalm 132 in this closing remarks about the ark in Psalm 132. Uh, but keep in mind that this ark in Psalm 132 is a reference to the actual ark. This is some, this, uh, Psalm 132 is a psalm that's taken from, or part of the psalm that's uh, taken from the dedication of Solomon's temple. When he's talking about the ark being uh, put placed to rest in, in Solomon's temple, that's what it's referring to. It's praising the situation where finally God's uh, presence, the ark is a symbol of God's presence. That's a, a focal point of where God exists. It's not Mary, it's, it's, a, it's the focal place of God's presence. And that's what why it's mentioned in that verse and that's why Solomon's mentioning it in the dedication of the temple is because the ark is being placed in that temple. The, uh, the remainder of the argument seemed to center on the fact that this has been widely accepted by many different churches in church history for many years. And indeed, that should give people some reason to consider it as a, as a possibility of, uh, you know, why did so many people believe this if it's not correct? But the answer comes back to transitus literature. Literature, which, as was brought up, eventually was condemned. Literature, which, in the version that I provided to you from the translation, identified uh, as one of the scholarly translations by, uh, by William, included heretical material. And William insists that the original didn't, but it's quite hard to derive an original text of that particular document in a way that excises all of the heretical material. And indeed, if you say that the original didn't have it, then you have some trouble understanding how subsequently the book became condemned. In any event, the, the, the extra scriptural tradition 
this, the tradition outside of scripture as represented by the Book of Marriage Repose, even if, let's say, even if the Book of Marriage Repose had no heresy in it, in its original form, it's still not scripture. And it still shouldn't be accepted as such. And it, it, that tradition, the, those traditions that Mary was assumed, are the basis for the, what eventually becomes the dogma, whether or not they're cited. The fact that they're not cited is, is, is a strange point. It's a strange point to bring up. Yes, they're not cited, but so what? Why, why should they need to cite that? Is that the usual course? We, we're not told that. And indeed, they don't cite any specific uh, evidence of where this came from. Instead, it, it is a tradition. It's a human tradition. It's not an apostolic tradition. And we know it's a human, not apostolic, because it doesn't come from the scriptures, despite Pius XII claiming that the ultimate foundation of this is sacred writings. Now, unfortunately, sacred writings don't support what uh, Pope Pius had to say. He was mistaken. He, he taught something that was an error. It's not true that the scriptures teach this doctrine. And that's why he can come up with you know, these interesting interpretations of, of Psalms, of Song of Solomon, and uh, the idea that somehow Revelation 12 has some bearing on the bodily uh, assumption of Mary. So in short, I, I invite people to do exactly what has been suggested throughout the debate, which is to search the scripture and see whether these things are so. All right. Well, bef before we wrap up, first of all, big thanks to William and Francis being on the show. Look, there's over 300 of you. So right now I want to ask you, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, could you do that? That would make me feel good about myself. So if that's the only reason, you could do that for that reason. Um, second, uh, join us over on Locals. It's a free speech community. When TikTok comes after me, they already have. When YouTube comes after me, if I'm no longer here, I will be over on Locals, mattfrad.locals.com. Click the link below. Right after this video, I'm gonna go over there with a bunch of you um, and maybe have a bit of whiskey together. It's free to watch. You pay if you wanna comment. It's a great way to support us, mattfrad.locals.com. It's at the top of the description below. Fellas, where can we learn more about you? Will him. Yeah, people can find a lot about me over in my uh, website, patristicpillars.com or earlychurchfathers.com. It'll it'll lead them to the, the my webpage. They can find me on um, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, they can find everything I'm working on, more debates, more books that I'm working on. And uh, again, I urge everybody to research, uh, dig deeper and read more. Read the, read the fathers, read the Bible, and really pray above all pray and um get to church thank you william thanks again for being on mate francis thank you so much for trusting trusting this platform uh, to be on i really appreciate it you did a great job my pleasure all right should i mention my my stuff yeah plug uh, stuff Turton fan, <laughs> turtonfan.blogspot.com is my blog and you can find me on youtube at www.youtube dot com forward slash church and fan. Okay, I'll be sure to put links in the description right after this is over. So everyone who watches it after the fact, click the link below. All right, God bless guys. See you everybody. Thanks for being here. Bye. Hey, should we should we close with a Hail Mary? That's that's a joke. All right, bye. <laughs>